Hello, today I want to talk about triangulation pillars, or as they're more commonly known in the UK, trig points. Now, you can find trig points in every country in the world, but how they're constructed, what they look like, even what they're called is different in every country. As an example, in America, I think they're called trigonometrical stations. In Australia, they're just called trig stations. South Africa would call them trig beacons, and in France, they're geodesic stations. But regardless of what they look like or what they're called, you can use those trig points, these enormous big lumps of concrete, to actually create an exact map that will precisely measure every corner of a country you know, down to the millimeter. So today I want to go over how that's actually done. Now, let's start from the beginning. Before you can create a map, what you need is a baseline. A baseline is just a precisely measured distance between two points. As an example, in 1937, the Ordnance Survey measured a distance of just over 11 kilometers along the Ridgeway footpath in southern England that later became, no, became known as the uh, Liddington Baseline. Now, that baseline then had two trig points, one at either end, and that was extended outwards to make a triangle. So another trig point was added. Another triangle was added to each side of that first one, and these triangles kept continuing outwards until every section of the country was covered. There are a lot of websites that will tell you just what I've said. There are a lot of videos that will tell you just what I've said, but nobody actually explains the process. How do you create a triangle that may be two or three miles on either side? You can't stretch a tape measure along it. So that's what I want to do today. I want to go through the actual process of triangulation and how you use, as I said, these lumps of concrete to map an entire country. I suppose the first thing to go over is what exactly is this? Is it just a lump of concrete? <laughs> no, it's, it's not just a lump. It is an extremely precisely positioned lump of concrete. And what this was for is this would use as a base for a theodolite. And a theodolite could best be described as a telescope with an inbuilt protractor so that you could look through the telescope and take very precise angles from an object that was a long way away. Now these are always sighted so that you can see two other trig points in uh, some direction. So the surveyor could use his theodolite which would be placed onto the top and he could then take bearings or angles to nearby trig points. Each trig point has its altitude marked on a map and that is simply the difference between the trig points and the average sea level which in the UK is defined as a line marked on the wall in the harbour at Newlyn in Cornwall. It's known as ordnance datum. Now whereabouts on the trig point is the actual height? Is it the top or is it the bottom or in the middle? Now remember we're talking millimetres here so it has to be precise. Most trig points have one of these. They have a flush bracket. If they've never had a flush bracket, then the registered height is the, the nearest piece of natural ground. So if, if they have got a flush bracket, then the height marked on a map is of the flush bracket. Let's have a, a zoom in on, on this just so you know what I'm talking about. So this is a trig point flush bracket. In these, this is what they look like in the UK. They're called flush brackets just because they sit flush to the trig points. What you've got here is you've got four holes. You've got some letters, OSBM, which just stands for Ordnance Survey Benchmark. You've also got a three-pronged arrow and then a number. Um, sometimes they have a letter prefix to the number. Contrary to what I've heard many people say <laughs> this number has nothing whatsoever to do with the height of this trig point all it is is a it's a ledger reference so that the ordnance survey can identify this specific trig point and you know as opposed to any others so the four holes at the top what would happen is the a attachment would be attached an attachment will be attached, is that correct? Yeah, that'll do. An attachment will be attached to the flush bracket, which would allow a metal plate to be placed onto the top of the three-pronged arrow. 
the actual height of this trig point, the registered height, is the precise point at the top of the three pronged arrows. Now it's impossible to get hold of these attachments anymore because they're from the 1930s, 1960s time. So <laughs> I made my own. So this is what it looks like. I don't pretend to be a carpenter, um, but I'll have a go at most things. And what would happen is that would the, the circular sections at the top of the uh, attachment would be inserted into the top holes and then that would secure it. Then they would get a s piece of metal and they would run it along the top of the attachment into the flush bracket so that it's sitting on the top of the three pronged arrows. Using a spirit level they would simply make sure that the top of the attachment was uh, perfectly level, mine isn't, hang on, let me just adjust it slightly, yep that is now level and then they will, what they would do is they would get a, I can only describe it as a large ruler, I couldn't find one other than a very expensive one on Amazon so I thought I'd make my own. <laughs> this would then sit on top of the attachment and whoever was taking a theodolite reading from another hilltop or somewhere else could simply put their crosshairs on the ruler and let's say that they put their crosshairs on number five they would know that that was five inches or yards or whatever above the flush bracket and that's how flush brackets work on uh, ordnance survey trig points. One of the questions I get asked quite often when I'm talking about this subject is how do you actually measure a distance across valleys and lakes and what have you that may be two or three miles apart. I'm going to explain how you measure a location of a new trig point. Now this, so this is my survival group survival shelter but it'll do for our, uh, this, this is our new trig point so I'm just going to throw it in that direction into the long grass so here we go. I can't actually see it now. <laughs> I hope, hope I can find it in the long grass. What I've got is I've got T1, trig 1, and over there is T2, trig 2. So we know that T1 to T2 is 123. So it's 12.34 miles, 12.34 meters, 12.34 yards, or rods, or chains, or furlongs, or whatever the unit of measurement of the, that particular country is. So we need to work out we only know the distance between those two points. We need to now work out the sides of our triangle to our new uh, trig point that seems to have disappeared into the long grass. I'm sure we'll find it. So let's go through now how you actually do that. Those two points there, T1 and T2, trig 1 and trig 2, we know that the distance is 1, 2, 3, 4, or 12.34 between them. We also know from a previous survey that the the compass bearing from T1 to T2 is 134, so the back bearing must be 314. So I found my uh, new trig point, it's just here, so we'll drop this back where it is. So this is going to become, we've got T1 and T2, we'll call this, I don't know, TN, trig new. Now I don't have a theodolite, A, because they're very expensive for a proper one, um, and also I teach hand, you know, I teach navigation and map reading with a handheld compass. The most accurate compass I've got is this. This is the Francis Barker M73. You can take bearings down to 30 minutes with these. Um, 30 minutes, by the way, don't forget, there are 360 degrees in a circle, and each degree can be divided into 60 minutes. So 30 degrees is, oh sorry, 30 minutes is half a degree. Um, in fact, you probably take it down to 15 minutes, a quarter of a degree, if you're really you know, held it properly. So let's have a look. I need to take a bearing from here to T1. So let's have a look. I'll do it properly. Put my uh, thing up. So there's my bearing looking down. Keep it really still. The most accurate bearing I can get on this is 202.5. So I've got 202.5 degrees from here to T1, trig 1. Now I remember that the, uh, the bearing was 134, so the difference between 205, sorry 202.5 and 134 is, hang on, <laughs> I should have got a calculator, 
six, uh, 68 and a half degrees. So I know that the angle of the triangle from this point here to T1 is 68.5. So I'm going to do exactly the same to T2 and then we'll go and draw it on our outdoor classroom board. So here we go. So from T1, which is here, the new point is approximately here and we, we've got the, uh, the angle there. And this angle here is 68.5. So we also did the same to T2 and we had an angle of 51.5 there. Look at this, I mean, this is production value. Now, if you remember from school, the internal angles of a triangle must all add up to 180. So 51.5, 68.5, which means that the angle at Tn, trig nu, is 60 degrees. Obviously, I'm only using a handheld compass, so with a theodolite, I could get it much more exact. So just by using really basic maths, we've now got the angles of our triangle, which if you remember was 68.5, 51.5, and 60. Now, because of those numbers, you'll remember from school that that is an acute triangle because all the numbers are less than 90. And also it's an acute scalene triangle. And because it's a scalene triangle, we're going to use the law of sines. But unlike when I was at school, <laughs> nowadays, the modern days, we can actually use a calculator on a mobile phone to actually work out the distances because with those distant, with those angles and that one side of the triangle that we already know, we can use the law of sines to actually give us the distances from this point here to the other two trig points. So we know all the, the angles, so what we've just calculated, we need to calculate the distances between the trig points. So here's T1, T2, and T nu. So if you remember, what we need to do is we know this distance, 12.34. So from that, we can do, let's have a look, 12.34. So times the sine of this angle here from T1. So that's going to be 68.5 divided by the sine of 60, which is this in the opposite direction. So it's going to be divided by the sine of 60. And we calculated that that was from there to there. That is, so 13 point, um, what did we say it was, 258. Okay, so that gives us that, that's meters by the way here. And we can do exactly the same on the other side down here. So if you remember, We calculated that that gave us 11.15 meters. So we know that this one was 12.34 meters. So we've now got the distance to our new trig point, which is here, from these trig points here. So we now know the exact distance. I mean, obviously, as I said, if I had a theodolite, it'd be a little bit, it'd be a lot more. Uh, accurate but this will do with a handheld compass so we've got the distance in meters between now between all the uh, all the trig points now what about the height the altitude of the new trig point how do we know what the altitude of tn is well we know the altitude of the trig point over here so we'll call that t1 yeah and we know that the flush bracket is i don't know three foot off the floor or one meter so all we need to do now, let's say it's slightly lower than T1. So there you go. Now using this triangle, we can calculate the lengths again, and that will calculate this. So I won't go through it, otherwise the video will be too long. But basically, if we know one point and we know this point here, we can actually calculate these three angles again, and that will give us all the different sides. So X will be the height. And all you do is it will be X, plus the height of T1. So X plus T1. It's like an algebra lesson, this isn't it? There you go. So that's how we work out the maths. So is knowing all this going to make you a better navigator, better at map reading, better at finding your way around the countryside? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I just find it interesting, so hopefully you do. 
So next time you see a trig point, you'll know that it's not just a big lump of concrete and you'll know exactly why it's positioned where it is and also how it's used to create a map of an entire country. So thanks for watching.